Tonight, we are going to be jumping into Luke chapter 19. Now, this is the third part in a three-part series that I started all the way back in November. So, you know, no, no blame is yours if you don't have a clue where we were before. Uh, so I'll just give you the quick run-up. Uh, so the second Sunday of November, we looked at Luke 17. We got to see the kingdom of God. Jesus got to spill some details about that. And if you follow through the whole book of Luke, you know he didn't talk in clear terms about the kingdom of God, but he did talk a lot about the kingdom of God. And so he gives a pretty clear picture of it there in chapter 17, which was very neat. And he talks about it in the now, the kingdom as it is now that he's come to earth, the kingdom as it is while we're still here. And then he also talks about the kingdom future when he returns and how it's going to just start to blossom. It's going to start to really grow then. And then the Sunday before that, we were in Luke 18, and we got to see him reveal his own sacrifice on the cross. He revealed that to the apostles and just spelled it out for them. Tonight, though, as we continue on to Jerusalem and then we finally reach Jerusalem at the end of the chapter, we're going to see both categories of people uh, represented in this chapter that we've seen so far in the other chapters, and that is the people that really get what Jesus is doing. They really get why he's there, what his mission is, and then those that don't those that really did not understand or thought they did. They misunderstood why he was there, what his mission was. And we're going to see the stark contrast in their responses. It is not at all close. When you understand what Jesus is all about and when you don't, you really have an odd response to him either way. And it, it weirds the other people out. When you understand, you weird out the people who don't. And when you don't, you weird out the people who do. It really is very polarizing. So we're going to jump in. Chapter 19 of Luke, uh, first seven verses, we get to see Zacchaeus. So Luke chapter 19 says this, Then Jesus entered the, uh, and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And so he made haste and he came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner? And so Jesus sees this tax collector, and he just immediately announces his need to get to know him. And it appears in Jesus' final journey to Jerusalem that there are several of these divinely appointed moments where he just needs to meet up with a person. This is critical for their life, for his mission, for the un, uh, unraveling story that everyone is picking up the pieces of. He needs these moments. And so Zacchaeus is one of them, but Zacchaeus has his own personal need. But people didn't like it. By and large, the, the same is true of all of his different little appointments, all these people he runs into along the way, and the same thing is usually the reason why. It's the type of person that he has these appointments with. You see, everyone's excited when Jesus has time for them, right? That's, that's pretty universal. Jesus has time for you, that's awesome. But most people have a category in their mind, a, a type of person, a class of person that they think is beneath them. I think it's the lower than them. And so it rankles. It annoys. It seems odd when Jesus has time for that person or when Jesus takes time for that person. Time you might be getting otherwise. And so there's so many that think, well, at least I'm not like them. And then they see Jesus go and interact with them. And it really, really messes with them. Tax collectors are that group. You may remember back in Luke 18, if you've studied that recently, but we looked at it back in November, and Jesus told a parable illustrating this exact point, that tax collectors were the class no one felt guilty for, for punishing. No one felt guilty for despising. Everyone thought they deserved every ounce of ridicule that came their way. And the Gospel of John, not Luke, but John, never even brings up tax collectors. They're not even mentioned in the whole Gospel. Mark mentions them a few times in chapter 2. And Matthew, who was a tax collector, does not mention tax collectors as much as Luke. Luke mentions them the most. And so in Luke's day, tax collectors working for Rome, they were considered outside the nation of Israel. Like they were actually traitors who had left the nation. 
that they were basically people who had committed treason against the, the common man of Israel. And so Luke documents this side of Jesus' ministry, that he keeps reaching out to these people. He keeps trying to bring them back in. And so we see it here today with Zacchaeus. Keep reading with me, verses 8 through 10. It says, Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So, this identity issue is a big deal. Everyone else seeing you as the outsider, as the traitor, the one who's left the nation. And then Jesus, he seems to speak to Zacchaeus, but also everyone around. And he says, this man not only has, has faith and salvation, and maybe the faith was obvious to a few. The salvation was definitely obvious to Jesus. But I think what most people missed was that he was a son of Abraham. They were sure he wasn't, that he had lost that. And Jesus affirms it, and he says, no, this guy, he is a son of Abraham. That strong desire in Zacchaeus to set things right, it was the evidence of the faith that would otherwise be invisible. He wants to give up all those things that are ill-gotten. He wants to make his life reflect the life of Jesus. There's a real change in him. Back in chapter 18, we actually saw Jesus give a command to a rich young ruler. He said, you know, give away everything you have to the poor. It was like an ultimatum. Either you have faith and this won't be a stretch for you, or you don't have faith and this will be impossible for you. And we don't see that ultimatum here. He never has to speak up. He never has to give this ultimatum to Zacchaeus because the faith was there from the start and suddenly the desire was just quickly followed. And so there was no test required. He was already passing the test before it was given. And so he is called by Jesus that true descendant of Abraham. And then he answers the complaints of the people. The people were upset that Jesus would be hanging with a tax collector under any circumstances. And then he just tells them, I came to seek and to save the lost. And that is such a perfect answer because they were certain he was lost. So when he announces that's why he's come, it really does fit with what they're thinking. Hopefully they can make that turn. Hopefully they can make that change. And I think those words are so important for us. It's a blessing to hear those words. So we should never be ashamed to share those words. Jesus wants to save those who are perishing in their sins. Can you imagine that moment where Jesus is standing up for the one that everyone's certain is the worst of the worst? Everyone's certain. I just picture myself in that position. I picture myself standing there knowing what I've done, knowing Jesus knows full well everything I've done, and Jesus says, no, he's a true son. He has faith. He has salvation. And it's so clear cut. It has nothing to do with what Zacchaeus is doing, the what he's doing, the wanting to pay back people. Well, he hasn't actually done it yet, right? He hasn't actually taken the money out in the streets and found the poor people. He's just stating he's going to. So it's not even the actions. It's the faith that, that goes before it. It's where the salvation springs from. It's where the actions spring from. That faith is the seed that starts everything. And so I think the question for us is, are we lost? If you're sitting here tonight and you are that lost person, you have the guilt of just a lifetime of mistakes weighing down on you, then turn to Jesus. He will save you. That's why he came. His journey to Jerusalem is all about his purchase of peace. It's all about him laying down his life so that he can redeem ours. And we're going to see tonight that there is this great pause between the sacrifice he makes on the cross and his return as the conquering, victorious king. And the reason for that great pause is that the message might be spread. It's that the gospel might go out. It's that all might be saved. That's the purpose for it. And so the people in this chapter mostly don't get it. Mostly that's the part they miss. If they get anything else, they miss this, is that he's pausing that more may be saved. Now the people here, they thought they were ready for the kingdom immediately. 
The people standing around listening to all this, the people complaining about Zacchaeus, the people we'll keep reading about in a minute, they all think they're ready. And they think they're ready purely because they're a physical descendant of Abraham. But that's like all it would take to partake in the kingdom. Just be born of the right family line. And that's going to make them somehow worthy. But Jesus understands their misconception, and so he sets them straight. And so we walk into this parable in chapter 19. Starting at verse 11, read with me through verse 14. Now, as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Therefore, he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called 10 of his servants, delivered to them 10 minas, and said to them, do business till I come. But his citizens hated them or sorry, hated him, and sent a delegation after him, saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. A nobleman traveling to a far country to receive a kingdom that was back where he started kind of seems weird to us. That doesn't fit with how things work now, and it's a little strange sounding, but it would have been totally normal to them, and, and it makes sense in the context of an empire. You see, in their day, a prince could not succeed his father and become the king unless he first traveled to see the emperor and received the emperor's blessing. As soon as the emperor says, yes, you're good to be king, then he can go back and he can become king back where he started. And in fact, this is what happened to their last ruler. Their last ruler wanted to succeed um, his father after his father died there in Israel. And he had to first travel to Rome to get the, the, you know, the say-so from the emperor. And in fact, a bunch of Jews chased him all the way to Rome and went there and complained and said, we don't want him for this reason and that reason. And he got the blessing. He, he got the okay from the emperor. And so he came back and was in charge. So they had just walked through this. So his parable makes total sense to them. This part about the servants is kind of what he's tacking on. And so that's the meat of the parable. So very important message here because he's expecting uh, or sorry, they are expecting things of him that he can't give them yet. They're expecting him to be the king right now, right now. And he's saying, no, that's not how it works. I have to go to my father first and I'll come back and then I'll be the king you're expecting. But not yet, not yet. And because of this, they were destined to miss what he did come to offer, what visit number one was really all about. They were so excited for visit two, they, they were ready to miss visit one. And they were so convinced of why he was there. They were so dead set, so certain that they would even misunderstand to the point of becoming part of the mob calling for his death. Ultimately, this misunderstanding, it leads to God's justice instead of his grace. He wanted to give them grace and they instead walk into his justice. It's so sad. We'll see in a minute. It brings Jesus to tears. But let's keep reading. There's a little bit more to the parable. Verses 15 through 19 say this. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Now remember, he gave 10 minas to 10 men. So each man got one mina to start with. Verse 16, then he came to the first saying, Master, your mina has earned 10 minas. He said to him, well done, good servant. Because you were faithful in a very little, have authority over 10 cities. And the second came saying, master, your mina has earned five minas. Likewise, he said to him, you also be over five cities. All right, let's pause there for just a second before we get to the, the real ending. Look at what's happened so far. I, th I think it'd be pretty amazing if you had any business, whether it's in the financial industry or any other realm, for, for someone you gave small authority over, for them to come back after a period of time, and any period of time, and say, look, I, I multiplied your investment tenfold. Like, that would be amazing. And in the financial space, that really is hard to come by. But remember, this is a parable. In the spiritual space, this isn't that extreme. And essentially, most of us could do this. I mean, you, you take your life and you spend it trying to spread the gospel. You spend it trying to lead people to Christ. And honestly, as long as you don't start late, you, you could do this. You could, you could be, you know, 
uh, involved in the saving of 10 lives. And that's a huge reward. That's a huge thing that 10 more people would join the kingdom. 10 more people would have eternal life. That's amazing. And most of us wouldn't, you know, die right after we reach number 10. We could keep going. We could keep on bringing salvation to more and more and more. Now, that is essentially what the parable is about, doing the work that Christ came to do, but doing it yourself. So it's also important to notice that Jesus does not explain heaven, the the end of this period when he returns, as being this great equalizer, that, you know, you all did good, so you all get the same reward. He actually goes out of his way to explain some did really good, and they're going to get a really good reward, and others did well, and they get, they get a reward too. But we're going to keep reading, and we'll see there is also a way to really do awful, to really do poorly. And reward isn't the right word for what you get. You still get eternal life. But essentially, he's giving that to everyone in the kingdom. That's the, that's the base condition of being part of an eternal kingdom is you live eternally. He's saying there's so much more waiting for you. There's so much more blessing that God wants to give to you. And I think this is good. I think it's fair. And it's going to be handed out by the perfect God of all the universe. So how could it not be? And I'm actually hopeful for that day. I'm hopeful for the day where the people over me are exclusively people that God has said, you deserve this position. You deserve this authority. Can you imagine if everyone over you, from your boss to the president, every single person was perfectly arranged in order of their level of possible responsibility? how good they could be at bearing responsibility, how well they govern things. That would be phenomenal to just see it go all the way up and then at the very top, there's Jesus. At the very top. That would be amazing. And I I can't wait. I think that's going to be an amazing day. Finally, governance will conform to the will of God and to his wisdom. So then we get to the end of the parable. This is where it turns a little sour. Look at verse 20. Then another came saying, Master, here is your mina which I have kept put away in a handkerchief. For I feared you, because you are an austere man. You collect what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, Out of your own mouth I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit, reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank, that at my coming I might have collected it with interest? Asking to at least collect his mina with interest makes a lot of sense when you discover that a mina is about three months of wages. This is, this is working full-time for, for a quarter of the year, all rolled down into one monetary denomination. So yeah, you could you get a fair bit of interest off that if you did put it in the bank. And remember, the spiritual equivalent of this is keeping the gospel squirreled away for yourself. It, trying to keep the kingdom small, effectively, Becoming like a gatekeeper to heaven. Well, I'm saved. I have heaven, but, you know, that's, that's good. We'll just leave it there. And so you could actually attribute this, in your head at least, to something like laziness or maybe even fear. But there's so much more at stake than just, like, your own comfort. There's someone else's life at stake in that decision of, I choose to not share the gospel. I choose to not maybe deal with a hard conversation. I choose to not go out on a limb to share something with someone maybe they aren't wanting to hear just yet. It's a much bigger deal for them than it is for you, no matter how big it feels for you. Each of us has been given so much with our salvation. We've been given spiritual gifts, we've been given blessings, and we've been given the tools to share this, this whole life, this kingdom life with other people. And so the people listening to Jesus were convinced that a fully realized kingdom was right around the corner, just days away. You know, if they're actually traveling with Jesus and you look at your map, Jericho, where they're at with Zacchaeus, is pretty close to Jerusalem. They're getting pretty close to this Messiah guy walking into the capital. This is it. This is where he takes the throne. This is where he starts beating Romans. They really thought this was right around the corner. And so they thought everything was going to be reset by Jesus in just days. And Jesus wanted them to fully embrace the style of the visitation this really was. It was not someone who was going to roll in with an army. It was not someone who was going to just, you know, tell the Romans to take a hike. This was not why he was there. But most of all, 
he was on this completely different mission from the one they thought of, and he wanted them to be counted as valuable servants in that mission. So it's not just a mental ascent kind of a thing or a head knowledge, oh, you understand, you don't understand. No, your life is going to be a response to what you think about Jesus. And either you think he's some kick-the-door-down military leader, let's take over, and so your life will be bent around that. Or you realize he came to die. He came to be the sacrifice. He came to save. And then you bend your life around that. It's going to create a very different response. So Then we get into 24 and 27. There's just a little bit more in this parable because there was another people group mentioned at the very beginning, those who didn't even want him to rule. And he said, verse 24, to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to him who has 10 minas. But they said to him, "Uh, master, he has 10 minas. (laughs) For I say to you that everyone who has will be given. And from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. But bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. This final justice is twofold. First, there's that proper positioning of Jesus' servants. Even the one who did poorly, still his servant. He's he's not cast out. He's not killed. There's there's no punishment. And it may seem like punishment because his mina is being taken away. But really, that was always the master's mina. It was always the master's money in the first place. So nothing was taken from him that was really his. It's just that he didn't receive a reward because he didn't do anything. He, he was lazy. He sat still. He had only what the master gave him, and that was good enough. No need to create increase. So first off, there's the positioning of the servants. Then secondly, you get the destruction of those who reject his authority. And when you look at the parable, the way it works out is this is the destruction of those who reject Jesus' authority. They reject who he is, the God of all creation the Son of God that died in our place. And so the people back then complained at the the fitting rewards that the master handed out in the parable, as I think most people would if they were standing by. They're looking at the guy who has now 10 minas. He's got 10 cities to rule over. There's another guy with like five minas, five cities to rule over. And there's one guy, and all he's got is this one mina. And the master says, yeah, he doesn't deserve that. Take it away. It seems unfair, but... It's just. It's proper. And so the master really didn't do anything wrong. And so this is the same with the Lord's blessings on us. He gives us all blessings, and then he tells us to go work. You know, in his other parables, it's go work the fields. For Peter, it's go fishing for men. He tells us to to get to it. And if you do, there's more blessings waiting. Verse 27, though, delivers an unmistakable reference to the destruction prophesied all the way back in Zechariah 14. Even though at this point in the chapter, in Luke, we haven't even hit the prophecies of Zechariah 9. But Jesus knew that some of Zechariah 9 was about to be fulfilled. Maybe you know where I'm going with this. But Zechariah 9.9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. This is back in Zechariah 9. Jesus is about to fulfill these words, and he is calling out to the rest of Zechariah. All the way down in 14, Zechariah talks about the destruction of those who see the millennial kingdom. They see, you know, Jesus ruling and reigning properly, and he's just and he's fair and he does everything right. And there's still some nations that look at him doing everything perfectly and go, don't care, don't want to be a part of it. And they refuse. They refuse to enter into the structure where Jesus is in charge. And then he issues judgment. And you can read about it if you want in Zechariah 14. It's swift and complete judgment. But it's judgment only on those who are responsible. And it tells you in 14 that there is a remnant of those nations. That the nations aren't wiped out wholly because some didn't have that obstinate heart. Some were actually on the fence or wanted to follow, and they couldn't because their own government wouldn't. And so he is very discerning in who receives that judgment. Keep going in Luke 19, uh, verses 28 through 36, we see this uh, fulfillment 
of Zechariah chapter 9. So Luke 19, 28 says, When he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass, when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you, where as you enter you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Like, why are you stealing my donkey? Uh, Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as, um, as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, why are you loosing the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus and they threw their own clothes on the colt and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Some of you guys are very familiar with the story. This is Palm Sunday. This is just a week before Jesus rises from the dead. And because of that, it's less than a week from when he dies. It is mighty close. And most people in this chapter, most people in this story did not get what they were closing in on. They did not get what they were drawing near to, but Jesus did. Jesus absolutely did. So this event, it takes place, interestingly, at the precise end of a countdown started hundreds of years back in the book of Daniel. I don't know if you guys have ever read Daniel. It's a great book for prophecy. It's very fun to read. There's a lot of neat stories at the beginning, and there's wild, wild imagery. But then you get some really interesting prophecies towards the end of the book. And in chapter 9, verses 25 and 26, give this prophecy. This is Gabriel speaking to Daniel. And Gabriel says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah, the prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war. Desolations are determined. And and there's more there. And if you keep reading verse 27, even kind of indicates, it at least alludes to the odd fact that there's going to be this waiting period between the Messiah showing up, the Messiah dying, not for himself. It's an amazing Old Testament detail. And then the real end when he returns and is king. And so you see in the prophecy this sort of juxtaposition of he dies, he's king. How does that work? Well, when you see how Jesus' life plays out, when you see all the other details we get in the New Testament, it makes total sense. But this prophecy was confusing back then. You have to see it. If you don't have the New Testament explaining it all, giving you all the detail to fill in between the gaps, it is confusing. But the math was not confusing. And so there were, we still have the documents to this day that have survived of people trying to break out the math and figure out how does this countdown work and which decree exactly, because there's actually four decrees of go ahead, rebuild Jerusalem. They all happen years apart. But when you go through and you look at the fine details in Daniel, it explains what needs to be in the decree for it to be the decree. And when you go through all the decrees, you can see the one from Artaxerxes in 444 BC is perfect totally fits the bill from what Gabriel tells Daniel. And when you realize that their years are actually 360 days long instead of 365, and you do the math, I kid you not, the math breaks down to actually being down to the week of Jesus' Passion Week. Down to the week. And the reason we don't have the exact perfect timing is because of we don't know the exact day on the calendar when the countdown started. We just know it was between two events that are a week apart. Does that kind of make sense? So like we know within a week of when the countdown starts and we can count the actual days to when Jesus rolls up into Jerusalem and Daniel perfectly describes how long that countdown is. I love that stuff. That's so cool. And so you can do the math too. Just keep in mind their years were 360 days long. And if you're reading a history book that tells you what year something happened, they're using a Gregorian date, which has 365. And so there's some math you have to do where you multiply and divide, but it's perfect. It lines up perfectly. It gets down to all the fine little details we know of from the New Testament about which year Jesus died, what time of year it was, because it was happening at Passover. We know the dates. It's all perfect. And so the people of Israel were watching for this day. They were counting the days until the Messiah would arrive and just 
you know, roll up and change everything. And that was the way they talked about it. They talked about it like a great reset of everything. Like it would change the way everything worked, the way the temple worked, the way the sacrifices worked, the way we relate to God. They knew it was going to change all of this. They didn't necessarily know what it was going to change into. They just knew what was on the docket to change. And so they were expectant of all these changes. But you wait like that for a few hundred years, and you start to fill in the blanks yourself. And this is where the danger is. That as you continue to construct in your own mind what God's will will be, of course, of course it would be this. Of course he would fix these things. Of course the things I care about are the things God's going to change. You can start to construct a false narrative of what the Messiah looks like. And so for hundreds of years, they built up this list on top of God's list of what the Messiah would be like. Once you do that, then it's really easy to miss the real deal. Even if he's walking into your city in the midst of a parade on the day you calculated he would arrive. And so they missed that truth that Christ came to suffer and die. He came to be our sacrifice. That was the first coming. It's like Daniel said, it was not for himself. His death was not for himself. The second coming is the one they were excited about. But Jesus wanted them to not only understand the difference, but to be excited about that intervening time span. He wanted them to be excited about the chance to spread the kingdom of God beyond the borders of Israel. He wanted them to be excited about the chance to bring anyone in. So it wouldn't have to be a war of you know, one nation against the world, but it could really be the whole world as one nation. And they weren't quite buying it. And you can see why it took so long if you read uh, 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter 3, verses 8 through 9 say this, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing, that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so throughout these chapters, we see these two people groups keep popping up of the ones who seem to get it, the outcasts seem to get it, and everyone else seems to miss it. And why? Well, it's that prideful notion, I know what God wants, versus the humble notion, I bring nothing to the table, and Jesus offering to save me is the best thing that's ever going to come my way. So I'm going to take hold of it. That's it. Those are the two people groups. I know better than God. I know God better than God. Or God knows me and he still wants to forgive me. All right, I give in. Please. And so people in that first mindset, though, they really have a hard time being convinced that they're wrong because they feel as though they've already aligned with God. It's just the God of their own making. And I know that they're hard to convince because they were standing in the presence of God, the Son, and they were still telling him he was wrong. That's some stubbornness. But those who were just humble and accepted what Jesus said at face value, oh my gosh, they were blessed. Their lives were changed. And this carries over to today. It has not changed other than the fact that Jesus isn't standing right there for you to talk to. But the facts are the same. You can be stubborn and assume you know God better than God, or you can just accept. He knows you, and he still wants to forgive you. Keep reading with me. Verse 37, it says this, Then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, so he's still riding that donkey, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. That's a key phrase. Verse 38, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. The victory in the hearts of those that place their faith in Jesus fully like Zacchaeus did, this victory that he would soon achieve on the cross, these are real victories. They have lasting consequences. They are absolutely concrete. But this moment where Jesus is riding to Jerusalem and there's just a parade going on, everyone screaming and cheering, singing out his praise, it seems like a victory until you read the rest of the story and then you realize these are the same people that a few days from now 
are going to be calling for his crucifixion. And it, it hollows out the whole experience, and it's not lost on Jesus. He completely gets it. This crowd of, of people that think they're cheering for the Messiah, Luke reveals it, they're cheering for the miracles. They're, they're cheering for the neat things that he showed them. And, and it's, it's good. It's good to be excited about what God's doing. But don't lose sight of God in pursuit of those experiences. You're going to miss the greater thing for the lesser. And so that's where they were. Right now they're cheering. But as soon as he doesn't kick out Rome, as soon as he doesn't stand up and raise a giant army and win the day militarily, they're going to flip. They're going to betray him. They really just wanted to see their will done. And they thought he was the one to do it. It's quite sad. And so his real victory does happen, though. It's just not this. This isn't the victory. I am so glad that Jesus' victory is not a parade that happened 2,000 years ago. That would be so meaningless for us in this room. His victory was not over earthly powers. It was not some Roman defeat. Again, maybe our history books would look a little different, but it's been 2,000 years. I don't think Rome ending back then would have made a huge difference to me. No, his victory was over the gates of hell. His victory was over death. This is so much more meaningful. It lasts and lasts and lasts. This is an eternal victory. And so Jesus isn't picking some political party. He, he's transcending all of that. He, he is even trying to transcend nationalities, though most of them are missing that too. Trying to transcend cultures. And this is not to say that Jesus has no interest in overthrowing the corrupt governments of the world and installing, you know, just leaders, righteous leaders in their place. He has plans to do that and more during his millennial reign. He's going to set all that stuff up, but he was about to defeat an even more stubborn enemy than any dictator. His chosen nation, though, was missing it. And so Jesus says that even the rocks would have cried out if no one else did. Because creation itself was looking forward to the freedom that he was going to buy on the cross. Freedom from the curse of sin. In Romans, Paul writes this, uh, chapter 8, verse 20. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. And so he says, yeah, the stones are going to cry out if these guys shut up. Don't ask them to shut up because it's going to freak you out if the stones start singing. He knew that the world was waiting for this moment where he goes to the cross. And so even if the people cheering don't get it, they're still doing the right thing. They're cheering for Jesus. And so few could really foresee that utter betrayal that's about to take place. And Jesus did, and it saddened him. He wasn't angry. He was moved to tears. Verses 41 through 44 say this, Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this, your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus was filled with sorrow that Jerusalem would be punished in 70 AD for missing and even rejecting its Messiah. Josephus actually records this event in great detail. But he also records the fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy in these words. He gives similar prophecy over in Matthew to the apostles. It's in Josephus' work called The Jewish War. And he quotes Eleazar ben Simon, who was there at the battle. He was within the walls when all this goes down. And Eleazar ben Simon says, It is now demolished to the very foundations and hath nothing but that monument of it preserved. I mean, the camp of those who hath destroyed it which still dwells upon its ruins. So the only thing marking Jerusalem as even existing was the camp of the army that destroyed it. That is how well leveled they leveled the city. It says the fire burned so hot elsewhere in Josephus' record 
that the bricks and stones began to crack and crumble and the mortar could not hold, that everything just fell apart. And so Jesus knew. He knew the multitudes were going to betray him. He knew that Jerusalem was going to be punished. But he never gave up on ministering to the individuals. He understood that the overall nation was rejecting him. He understood that overall Jerusalem would betray him. But there would always be those who saw him as the Son of God, and they believed in him. They put their faith in him. And so he ministers to his last day. And so we keep reading the end of the chapter here. We see what does that effort look like. Verses 45 through 48 say this, Then he went into the temple, and began to drive out those who bought and sold in it, saying to them, it is written, my house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple. But the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him and were unable to do anything for all the people were very attentive to hear him. And so Jesus did whatever it took to reach the lost, driving out those who were standing in the way of sacrifice generous giving and worship. It was something that he had every right to do. These were properly villainous people standing between God's people and him. So Jesus kicks them out. And Jesus also deserves our praise for what he has done and what he yet will do. And so he opens the door for them to praise God the same way he opens the door for us. He has saved us from our sins and from death itself. And he's not done. He's going to return and he's going to unite all of us in his kingdom, in his family. And until then, where will our focus be? That's, I think, the real question as you walk to Jerusalem with him. What are you going to spend your life focusing on? On the changes you're looking forward to? The the hope for what heaven will alter? On the things of this life you're really ready to be done with? or on the people who are perishing without hope. As we look forward to Christ's return, we must always stay mindful of the work that he's left for us. There will come a day when we see our boss face to face. And I hope that he'll say to each of us, well done, good and faithful servant. So be about his work. Spread the gospel in the here and now and be excited about it. This is the reason for his tarrying. This is the reason that he waits. It's to give you and me one more chance to share the gospel. One more chance. One more chance. All right, let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you've continued to give us chance after chance. We thank you that you've blessed us with the knowledge of the gospel. You've blessed us with your word. You've blessed us with your spirit that is constantly working on hearts. And so, Lord, I ask that you would give us courage to speak up in every moment, to leave nothing unsaid, to share with everyone we have the chance to, to minister to our last breath the way you did, to bring the gospel to every corner of the earth by every means possible. And we thank you, Lord, that you did that first. You did that for us, despite the hostility, despite the repercussions. You continue to spread that message. And Lord, thank you for going to to the cross for us. Thank you for beating back hell and death. And may we never forget that that is the primary purpose of why you came. May we never let anything else cloud that or get in the way of that. We love you, Jesus, and we can never pay you back for it, but we're going to spend our whole lives living for you. And so if there's anyone here that's hearing all this stuff about the gospel and you're realizing this is something you've never taken hold of, you've never been like Zacchaeus and just responded by putting your faith in Christ, if that's you today and you want to, you want to say to Jesus, I'd like to follow you. I want to, I want to repent of all those things I've done. You can enter into his kingdom, his family, and his forgiveness today. That can be yours. So I would just ask you to raise up your hand high enough for me to see so that you can pray along with me. I'll help you with some words and you can talk to him. You can ask for that forgiveness. You can tell him you're repenting right now. Anyone tonight. And if you're out there on the internet, I can't see your hand. If you're out there on the radio, keep driving. 
but you can pray along. You can repeat these words. And the change happens, like we talked about before, not from the action, but from the faith. The action follows the faith. And so you can just repeat these words with me and put your faith in Christ. Jesus, thank you for dying in my place. Thank you for being the sacrifice that covers my sins. Please forgive me. I repent of all that stuff. There's probably more stuff than I even know about. But Lord, I ask for you to fill me with your Holy Spirit. Use it to guide me, to show me what I still have yet to repent of. Use it to show me how to live for you. Use it to grow me, to become more like you. Lord, I want to be part of your kingdom starting now. Help me to be a worthy servant. And when this life ends, Lord, take me into the next so I can live with you forever. I pray all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. If anyone here tonight prayed that prayer, or if you're out there on the internet or the radio and you prayed that prayer, talk to us. Let us know, however you can. We want to pray with you. We want to answer any questions you have. We want to make sure you have a Bible you can read. Just connect with you. All right, and with that, we have one more worship song to sing together.